Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. Those of you who have been following along know that we're uh, looking at things in the book of Romans. And this time we want to go to chapter 12 in that book. So take your Bible, open it to the book of Romans, chapter 12, and we'll start right at the beginning with verse 1. And the subheading here is living sacrifices to God. And this is the New King James Version. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly accept, holy, acceptable to God. That holy is with an H, not with a W. Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, in Desire of Ages, uh, page 439, there's a little comment on this verse 2 that we just read, and it says, it's titled, One Cherished Sin. Any habit or practice that would lead unto sin and bring dishonor upon Christ would be better put away whatever the sacrifice. That which dishonors God cannot benefit the soul. The blessing of heaven cannot attend any man in violating the eternal principles of right. And one sin cherished is sufficient to work the degradation of the character and to mislead others. I think that goes right along with that H-O-L-Y part of the first verse too. Mm -hmm. How can we improve on that? Well, let's talk about what it means. Just to remind you where we are, uh, the first eight chapters of Romans is Paul's sort of carefully, methodically putting out what he believes is the gospel. In chapters 9 to 11, he says, Now I know that uh, my Jewish friends, my Jewish kinsmen, believe that they have an inside track and that they should, have a special, they should be treated in special ways and so forth. They don't like this gospel that's good for everybody. And so he, he talks about them for three chapters. Now, in the last four chapters, chapters four, four, I'm sorry, 12 through 16, he's going to focus on practical issues in, deal, in, in living the Christian life, really. <clears throat> in this first verse, my, my Bible says, so then, my friends, because of God's great mercy to us, I appeal to you, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to his service and pleasing to him, this is the true worship that you should offer. King James' reasonable service. It's interesting that the two words there are, are quite unique in the Bible. Um, they're only used a few places. The first word is logike, which sounds like logical and reasonable. Um, but in actual fact, in the, in the original context, it meant something like spiritual, something like uh, some translations has as an act of intelligent worship, that's Phillips, or worship of mind and heart, that's the New English Bible, um, so forth like that. The other word is latreia. It's not the service of a slave, that would be dule. It's not the service of a free man, diaconia. It's a service, it involves spiritual worship, that's latreia, the worship that you would offer as, I mean, the service you would offer a priest might offer in, in, a, in, the, in the temple in Jerusalem. So what God is saying here in this first verse really is, what I want is no, no more dead pigeons, 
no more dead lambs, no more dead goats, all that kind of stuff burned in the fire and so forth. What I want is living representatives of my love and my character that will shine out to the whole world, if you remember Matthew 5, 16. So what kind of sacrifices would that be? My question for all of you. Living sacrifices that would represent the worship of mind and heart. I think that's when we give up on self. Mm. And we sacrifice self to the will that the Holy Spirit would put into us. Create in me a heart of flesh. Mm -hmm. Take away my stony heart. Who was it that said, um, I must decrease and Christ must increase? Or John do I have that backwards? No, that's correct. John so, the Baptist. Okay, so as, as a sinful person, you must shrink your sins and let Christ uh, develop your personality mm -hmm. and increase his characteris characteris character in you. So your character must decrease mm -hmm. and his character in you must increase. That's interesting in light of what he says in Galatians 5, which we studied a couple few weeks ago, where there it says the last of the fruit of the Spirit is actually self-control. So how does that fit in with this? I was going to ask Norm, how is that manifest in our daily lives? Well, <laughs> I know what you're saying, but I, when I, we... I, I'm not sure I know, I, I know I don't know completely, but I, I'm quite sure that it's something different than what, what we have as the usual. If Paul or Abraham or Moses are the examples that are the friends of God, which I think this is asking us to be, to, then I think it's a kind of dedication to his work, to his calling, that uh, rises to a level that we have not experienced. Right. And God help well, us. What, what kind of sacrifice is it? I mean, when you do things for your friend, what kind of sacrifice is that? If I might say, uh, in verse 20, this, of course, there are hundreds of answers. Mm -hmm. But in verse 20, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. Mm -hmm. This kind of like outside of our comfort zone. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a spiritual sacrifice. We like our self, our self, it's me, me, me. And, and we all have a long ways to go, but, you know, Let's think about the other people, God's people, who may well, not be with him yet. What reminds me of sacrifice is when I do the dishes. I hate doing dishes, but sometimes, you know, the cook has worked really hard and, you know, you feel like you must help out, and I do the dishes. That, to well, me, is a sacrifice. Years. Well, it's a sacrifice. Maybe a reasonable sacrifice. What, Sullen submission? Couldn't you say... <laughs> it, it, Maybe... Meaning, one of the meanings is don't let the vicissitudes of life ruin your spiritual focus. Yeah. Well, the word there mm. that's, that I mentioned, logi K, is used one other place in the Bible, and that's over in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. It says, be like newborn babies, always thirsty for the pure logi K milk. And it's translated spiritual milk, so that by drinking it, you may grow up and be saved. So that's where I got the idea that this would be spiritual milk. Can I take one more track at yeah. that? Uh, second volume of the Testimonies, page 24, starts a chapter called Doing for Christ. And it starts out this way. From what has been shown me, Sabbath keepers are growing more selfish as they increase in riches. Their love for Christ and his people is decreasing. They do not see the wants of the needy nor feel their sufferings and sorrows. They do not realize that in neglecting the poor and the suffering, they neglect Christ. And that in relieving the wants and sufferings of the poor as far as possible, they minister to Jesus. Maybe there's some of that that I need to get involved with that I haven't before in the context of giving yourself a holy, complete sacrifice. Remember that it's, it's, it's very clear in Scripture that 
the first selfish person in the universe was Satan. That's right. And following the selfish way, we are following Satan's side. If we follow the loving way, that's God's way. He was the first unselfish person, the person who reached out to others and so forth. So the choice is ours. Do we want to act in a selfish way, follow Satan's example? Do we want to act in a loving way and follow God's example? It's just really like that. And it's, I mean, it's, let's be honest. We all start out as naturally very selfish individuals. Who, who, who has seen a baby that wants to administer to other people? All he's right. concerned about is his own needs. And, and we understand why a baby needs to be like that. He doesn't have time to focus on, he doesn't understand anything except his own needs. But maybe what we see as normality around us in the environment that we live in isn't what she's talking about. What's a reasonable definition of selfishness? Selfishness means putting your own interests before you put up anybody else's interests. It means, it means thinking of yourself first. And could that be something different for each of us? Could I'm be. Sure you it know, is. I mean, there are certain people that you meet, they're just nice people. Mm -hmm. Some, it's not going to be as big a sacrifice for them to go and do the dishes. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, okay, that's then. just not a big sacrifice for them. Well, that's me, well that's then normal. they're not sacrificing anymore. Okay. Let, let me tell so you. So they have to find something else that's within their. Let me tell you an interesting illustration okay. of that, even from a worldly context. Uh, I now work in a federally qualified health center, under the auspices of what used to be Loma Linda University. I mean, we used to be under the auspices of Loma Linda University, and now we're a separate. Ent entity, uh, although we're very closely wo work very close together. Um, someone came and presented some statistics at a meeting of the of the doctors in that facility today, and said that the national organization that sponsors community health centers has discovered that if during his training you get a medical assist a medical student or a resident to spend part of their time working in that environment. And where you're actually reaching out to the poor people and taking care of Medicaid people and people who don't have any insurance, if you actually get them to spend part of their training time in a place like that, they're six times more likely to do those kinds of things when they get out on their own than they are if they've never exposed to that in their training. I, th I think that, that fits with the idea that uh, medical students and residents who spend part of their time in a foreign country mm -hmm and see what other uh, countries, how different we are, mm -hmm. how far out of the bell curve we are from the rest of the world, get a different world view, and I think that's what he's saying there. Yeah. Question. Yeah. Are we talking about washing dishes or uh, the need to go and witness to others about the gospel? What's well, the difference? Uh, neither. <laughs> We're talking about something you don't want to do, but you know you should do it. It might be that washing the dishes is what is needed and if that was what is needed I'm pretty sure Jesus would have been there washing he the washed dishes. Feet, he? He, he washed feet, didn't he? He washed feet. Yeah, he'd have no problem with dishes. Well, <laughs> look, look at Romans 12, the last part. Uh, Ken already read a little bit of that. Started with verse 14. Ask God, I mean imagine this when talking about selfishness versus unselfishness. Ask God to bless those who persecute you. Yes, ask him to bless, not to curse. Be happy with those who are happy. Weep with those who weep. Have the same concern for everyone. Do not be proud, but accept humble duties. Do not think of yourselves as wise. If someone has done you wrong, do not repay him with the wrong. Try to do whatever con what everyone considers to be good. Do everything possible on your part to live in peace with everybody. Never take revenge, my friends, but instead let God's anger do it. For the scripture says, I will take revenge, I will pay back, says the Lord. By the way, if uh, God should uh, deal with your enemy by converting him and winning them, and you end up living next door to him forever in, in heaven, would you complain? No. no. And he goes on, instead, as the scripture says, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them a drink. For by doing this, you will make them burn with shame. And that's, of course, in the King James heaping coals of fire on their head. Do not let evil defeat you. Instead, conquer evil with good. 
I mean, that's a pretty hard... It's not easy for selfish people, but that's a pretty clear statement, isn't it? I think it's interesting, too. We've been told be wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be a fool. You, you, you've got to keep your wits about you, in other words. Mm -hmm. So is that like um, not fighting fire with fire, but fire with water? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, you know, the United States uh, gives millions of money in foreign aid. But it doesn't, I guess you don't look for good when you do something for your enemies, like, or maybe that's a different circumstance. It seems well, it's... The idea is to, th that hopefully you, they will get at least a little bit less evil. Mm -hmm. So when you do good for an enemy, you're not to expect anything in return. Well, that's not what that verse says, is it? It doesn't say anything about getting anything back. It just says to do good to your enemy. I Actually, think. you're taking a chance, aren't you? Um, yeah, you're taking a chance. You're taking a chance to see whether something really comes back from your efforts or not. Yep. And that's kind of what faith is all about, isn't it? You mm -hmm. do things based on faith. And when, when Jesus hung on the cross, it looked like he'd taken a pretty big chance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, look at, look at 13, Romans 13. One. This is a very interesting statement here. Everyone must obey state authorities because no authority exists without God's permission. And the existing authorities have been put there by God. And that would include Nero and Hitler and Stalin and Lenin and Idi Amin and Obote. Would that include Ted Wilson? Well, where... How could you put that in the same... <laughs> well, I, yeah, let's not put Stalin. Yeah, why church, not, though? If it, does that go for church authorities also? Oh. Is that, I've got a question there. I've <laughs> pondered this many times. Is that what the translation says? In one sense, God does rule over, but is he just loosening the reins and letting the devil take hold of the cart and run? Well, it's that's not what it says. Basically, what it's really saying is that uh, at least as I understand it, and, and I think there's, there's quite a bit of support for this. Basically what he's saying is the Christian's job is not to try to overthrow the government. Okay. Okay. He says that there's a lot of things, you know, if, if Christians were to resolve every evil that they see in the world, we could be running around trying to feed the poor, we could be running around trying to stop everybody from fighting, we could be running around doing all kinds of things, and we would lose our mission. We, we, we would completely lose our, our direction. We, we would just disperse into, you know, into a million pieces, each person trying to focus on what he thinks is the big issue out there in society. What, he's, what I think is happening is Paul says, the way to get to a solution to the world's problems, the fastest possible way is to preach the gospel so Jesus will come back again. Because you're not going to solve it short of that. That's a really a full-time job. You don't yeah. need to take on any... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that why Paul didn't take on slavery and why Jesus didn't take on slavery and yes. other things like that? Exactly. I mean, imagine if the church, a small little Christian church, had decided that it was their job to abolish slavery when two-thirds or at least 60% of the people in the Mediterranean world were slaves. I mean, they would have been jumped on so, I mean, even worse than they were. I think it's a Desire of Ages 509, something like that. Uh, the title of the chapter is Not With Outward Show. And Jesus knew saw what was going on mm. and the, the the corruption and the and the mm. religious things. You don't go it by attacking those because it you change people's mind one by one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, what happens if you're in an army? Of course, you're in the army because the authorities say you need to be there. Mm. But then you're fighting another army that who's has authority on the other side of the world, and mm. they're fighting because their authority. authorities on their side. Yes. So how is that working according to this? Well, obviously if everybody were behaving like this, well, or like the whole of Romans, wars would stop. There well, wouldn't be any war. Yeah, but that's not assuming that wars have stopped here. I mean, no. authorities are authorities. And, and he says any, any authority has been established by God. Yeah. And the Seventh-day Adventist Church, as you know, has taken the stand that 
if we are drafted and required to serve military service, instead of going to prison for being a draft dodger, we should go in and serve on a non-combatant basis. No matter which side of the war we're in, we should be in there to try to save lives and not to take lives. And I think that's under the circumstances in which we live. Un in this kind of evil world, that's probably the best we can do. Right. So, it's interesting that after discussing uh, st state authorities and working with the governments and all that kind of stuff in the first seven verses of Romans 13, he goes to verse 8, and this is what he follows with. Be under obligation to no one. The only obligation you have is to love one another. Whoever does this has obeyed the law. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not commit murder, do not steal, do not desire what belongs to someone else. Where do those commandments come from? Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, yeah. All these and any others besides are summed up in the one command, love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you love others, you will never do them wrong. To love, then, is to obey the whole law. Is that true? To love is to obey the whole law? Well, any reason why you do any part of the law is because of love, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's the mortar and the, the laws are the bricks, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're all, we, we, none of us have any problem. We've talked about the selfish side, we've talked about Satan's side, and now we've talked about the loving side, and we all agree. There's no problem, right? Oh, yeah, we'll all no just problems. start being loving all day long. Let's go home, go home. <laughs> Well, you know, when, when you tell students to do something, uh, love one another. In this classroom, we're to all oh, but we say respect one another. And you just don't say respect one another. You usually have a bunch of rules on the bulletin board. No throwing uh, spit wads, no this, no that, no that, no that, no that. And that's how you show love for one another. And so I feel like God wrote those Ten Commandments for us, and he says this what it is what it means to love one another. And any time you have a question, take a look at what I've written on the board there. Mm -hmm. Type of education. This is, how, this is respect. This is respect, and here's how it's defined. Does that mean that Seventh Adventists should never speak out against evils in the world as we see it? I hope not. No. <laughs> Well, you mean, uh, well, John the Baptist well, surely Is did. there ever a time for us to engage in, quote, civil disobedience? Should we be marching sometimes? I say yes, yes. <laughs> well, I, over what issue, over what yeah. type of issue would, would we say that civil disobedience would be the appropriate? That's the, that's the question. Uh, let's talk about how it's going to go. We know that the day is coming when there's going to be a national Sunday law. Should we fight against that? What about the day when there will be an international Sunday law? Or should we be grateful because that means the end is coming soon? Uh, or I, I think shouldn't our message, sorry to interrupt you, Norm, shouldn't our message just be love, peace, joy, Jesus, the Lord is coming soon? Does that mean we cooperate with the national Sunday law? Uh, we don't have to. I mean, we need to abide by what God has told us. Mm -hmm. So if that seems to be in conflict because he's told us to keep the Sabbath. I, th I think we'd be foolish if we didn't use the parameters of the law to maintain what we have. We know the day is coming where that will probably be thrown out and then it's mm -hmm. we're, we're resting in God. That's Revelation mm -hmm. tells us about uh, in 14, the, the three angels' messages, and then there's a fourth angel that mm -hmm. comes to Chapter enlighten 18. the whole world with this message. And it's the message of separation. And that message is, is a message of evangelism to the world. They, they will see what it means to us because of what we will be uh, willing to go through to protect that. And, and there will be huge demonstrations. There, there will be uh, the radio news when, when somebody is put in jail or goes to court for, for this issue. Uh, there's going to be 
protest, yes. Yeah. One, one way of thinking about that is represented by what Paul says elsewhere in his writings under Philippians. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. If you have the King James Version, it will say, Our conversation is in heaven, but my Good News Bible, um, translating the Greek a little more precisely, we, however, are citizens of heaven, and we eagerly wait for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come from heaven. So Ellen White, very interesting, without knowing any Greek, says, and I'm quoting from Gospel Workers, page 393, those who stand as educators, as ministers, as laborers together with God in any line have no battles to fight in the political world. Their citizenship is in heaven. There's, there, there, there are more than 20 examples I know of where Ellen White gets the Greek exactly right. Somehow, she got it exactly right when there were no translations in her day that had it correct. So we're citizens of heaven, so we have to abide by that law also. That's our so first as long priority. So as, as long as the authoritative law on this planet doesn't come in conflict with our hometown, heaven, mm -hmm. then we can go along with it. But if it comes in conflict, we have to, uh, our hometown law, heaven, supersedes any and all other law. The best example of how to deal with social issues and the whole Bible is undoubtedly the book of Philemon. We will be coming to Philemon pretty soon in our discussion. But just very briefly, uh, Onesimus was a runaway slave. The word Onesimus means useful. And there were quite a number of slaves who had that name. Onesimus had escaped, apparently he had stolen some money from his master, escaped, fled to Rome thinking he'd get lost in the, in the crowds in Rome and probably did for a period of time. Then somehow or other, he came into contact with Paul. And having come into contact with Paul, he was won by the gospel and became a Christian. And after a while, Paul said, you know what? Your master, the one you stole from and ran away from, is actually a Christian, and the time has come for you to go back. And he wrote the short one-chapter book of Philemon, back to Philemon, who was his master, and sent Onesimus back with that and if you read that book, you'll see how Paul just says, you know, you Philemon, I know that if the normal reaction would be if you, if you discover, if you find a runaway slave, you're going to kill him. But that's not what we Christians do. You're going to treat him like a brother. And furthermore, if he owes anything, put it to my account. And by the way, remember that you owe me your very life. <laughs> <laughs> and then he says, oh, and by the way, I'm, I'm about to get out of jail. and I'm planning to come and visit you. I'm going to be checking on you. <laughs> you no pressure, though. No, no. no, <laughs> no. Offer he couldn't refuse. <laughs> offer he couldn't refuse, right, exactly. Well, the interesting story is, now we, we can't say this 100%, like, because like I said, there were a number of slaves with the name Onesimus. But it's very interesting that at early 2nd century, this would be 40, 50 years after this book of, 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 of um, Philemon was written, the bishop... The head of, bishop was a word, term they used in those days. The head of the church in Ephesus was a man by the name of Onesimus. Mm -hmm. So that would seem to suggest that if you have the right attitude and you take the right approach to people, that it might have very, very good results. It's an interesting, we'll find out the truth when we get to heaven. But there's a lot more to come, so don't go away, we'll be right back.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to join us. Uh, we have been talking about Romans chapters 12 and 13. We're now going to go to Romans 14. And Romans 14 is an incredible study in challenging ideas, dealing with issues within the church and so forth. Let me read the first few verses there and you'll see um, where it's going to take us. Welcome those who are weak in faith. Now this would be into the church. He's talking about the church now. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but do not argue with them about their own personal opinions. Some people's faith allows them to eat anything, but the person who is weak in the faith eats only vegetables. So now you know where you are. If you're a vegetarian, wh what class you fit in. The person who will eat anything is not to despise the one who doesn't, while the one who eats only vegetables is not to pass judgment on the one who will eat anything. For God has accepted that person. Who are you to judge the servant of someone else? It is their own master who will decide whether they succeed or fail. And they will succeed because the Lord is able to make them succeed. And of course, he's implying that the Lord of all Christians is, I mean, the master of all Christians is who? The Lord, right? Some people think that a certain day is more important than other days. Oh dear, what are we going to do now? While others think that all days are the same. We each should firmly make up our own minds. Now, doesn't that basically just wipe out any convictions you've had about the Sabbath, about any other Christian teaching, right? Nope. No. Sorry. He, verse 6, he who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Okay. But I, I, regard, we I regard Wednesday as special. I'm doing that for the Lord. Praise the Lord. I... Personally, I regard every day as special, but especially the Sabbath because it's a memorial to God. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just kind of an honor thing to God. I'm nobody, but I can give my tiny little bit of you honor. You know, it's, to it him. sounds like he's, he's valuing the person before their ideas. Mm -hmm. That's the first step. And um, if you value the person, you're going to be more tolerant of everybody. Uh, and then you can get into the truth, you know, what's better and what's inferior, what's, what's all that I stuff, but you both talk to each other. It's easy for us to bring our 21st century minds to this. And mm -hmm. the, there was no discussion here about the Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath. No. That's not what was being discussed. What was being discussed was all of the days, the holy days of the ceremonial system. And the Judaizers wanted to have more of those days as made prominent. And Paul didn't see them as that important. But he didn't want to get after an individual. He didn't want to, to make somebody weak in the church stumble over those kinds of issues. This but he, is, wouldn't, he wasn't giving up on the Seventh-day Sabbath here one no. little bit. Well, you, you gave us a lot of stuff there that um, I would say prove it. We well, know that. We well, know find that. Where the, find it, just well, one around. day over the other day. What well, else could that be? Paul's, yes. Paul's own writings in Hebrews tells us there therefore remains a Sabbath day's rest for the people of God. That's well, very clear cut. That's good. That's good. But still, you got one day over the other. This is written by a, a famous Sunday church. The notes in here, it says, though it was no longer required by God, the weak Jewish believer felt compelled to observe the Sabbath and other special days associated with Judaism. So I would disagree with though it was no longer required by God because God never changes and, and he that's wrote That's because you're weak. <laughs> well, well he wrote the law in stone with his you're finger weak in and it says remember to me well, <laughs> let's let's look at this in historical context. Let's let's do what, sort of what Norm suggested the best we can. The first time this issue about how see the real issue is this. The Judaizers, the ones these are Christians who, who were firmly Jews, and, and, and Acts 15, verse 5 suggests where they came from. Uh, maybe I better read it. But some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up, and, believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and told to obey the law of Moses. So no question about the fact what the argument was about. 
And remember that the real difficulty was here, these people who were so absolutely wedded to their Judaism were determined that Christianity must be nothing more than a sect of Judaism. And they wanted to force every Gentile who wanted to be a Christian to become a Jew first and then they could become a Christian. And Paul just fought those people tooth and nail everywhere. They, they were the ones who, who managed to get him stoned. They were the ones who managed to get him in prison, et cetera, et cetera. He had lots of trouble from these people. And these were these people. Now, the Jewish people, the straight Jewish people also caused a lot of trouble. But even some Jewish believers caused him a lot of trouble. Let's, okay, so that's what happened. So as a result of Paul's and Barnabas's work, out there converting the Gentiles, they became really alarmed because it looked like the way the gospel was spreading among the Gentiles, that pretty soon there would be more Gentile Christians than there were Jewish Christians, and, Jew and, and Christianity would start looking like a Gentile church. And that just made them boil. They did not want that at all. Well, you know, they called a conference in Jerusalem, and Paul and Barnabas went down there and explained their position, and the whole thing is discussed in Acts 15. And it winds up with these verses. They finally wrote a letter. And this is, this is I'm going to read from Acts 15, starting with verse 28. The Holy Spirit and we have agreed not to put any other burden on you besides these necessary rules. Eat no food that has been offered to idols. Eat no blood. Eat no animal that has been strangled. And keep yourselves from sexual immorality. You will do well if you take care not to do these things with our best wishes. Now, this is not a, a, a new presentation of the gospel, not at all. What this is, is rules that they say, if you want to go to church and you want to be able to sit down in peace beside a formerly Jewish Christian without coming to blows, these are the things that you have to do. Now, let's, let's congratulate them on setting aside a million, I'm exaggerating a little bit, Jewish rules that they followed as Pharisees, okay? They had, they had finally agreed, okay, we're not going to require any of those things. We're just going to require these four things. Well, when Paul got back to Corinth, and he's writing a letter to, and he's worked in Ephesus, and he's writing a letter to uh, the people in Rome, and he's writing from Corinth, he has some very interesting things to say about that. Look at... 1 Corinthians chapter 8. We talked about this earlier, but let's just review it very briefly. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Now concerning what you wrote about food offered to idols. Now we're going to find out that Romans 14 is all about the same subject. It is true, of course, that all of us have knowledge, as they say. Such knowledge, however, puffs a person up with pride, but love builds up. Those who think they know something really don't know as they ought to know, but the person who loves God is known by him. So then, about eating the food offered to idols, we know that an idol stands for something that does not really exist. We know that there is only the one God. Even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, and even though there are many of these gods and lords, yet there is for us only one God, the Father, who is the creator of all things and for whom we live, and there is only one Lord, Jesus Christ, to whom all things were created and through whom we live. So you can see Paul is saying, you know, I, it's about time for me to say something really significant here. Uh, so get yourself ready, bolt yourself down to your chair, and let's move on. But not everyone knows this truth. Some people have been so used to idols that to this day when they eat such food, they still think of it as food that belongs to an idol. Their conscience is weak. Does that sound like Romans 1? I mean, 14, verse 1. Mm -hmm. And they feel they are defiled by the food. Food, however, will not improve our relation with God. We should not lose anything if we do not eat, nor should we gain anything if we do eat. Okay, now this is not saying you can eat arsenic, you can eat whatever you feel like. No, this is not talking about diet in any way. What is Paul talking about? Well, it turns out that in the center of Corinth, where he was, was as he wrote Raymond, Romans and Galatians, there was a market. But on the, and, and people would bring their fruits and their vegetables and their wine and their meat and everything into this market from various places in the surrounding territories. And as they came into town, there were these temples along the road, and it was expected 
that they would offer a portion of what they had brought to town uh, to those idols, and that was supposed to mean that the rest of what they had to sell was also blessed by those gods. And if you if you if you ate that material that had been brought to the market, then you would be in a, in one sense offering uh, worship and, and and recognizing the authority of those pagan gods. Paul says, you know, those pagan gods have no authority whatsoever. They're pieces of metal, they're pieces of stone, they're pieces of wood. They cannot affect the food in any way. So you can start to see where Paul is going with his argument. Furthermore, if you stop to think about it, what are these small temples with all this food being up? And by the way, we know as a fact that the main offerings that were given to these temples were wine and meat. These were the main things that were considered of value and which would be offered as a, as a tribute or as an offering to the god. So what would the people who operated the temples, what would they end up with? A lot of wine and a lot of meat. What are they going to do with all this wine and meat? Because it's already been killed and, and slaughtered. What are they going to do with all that? Eat and drink. Well, a little bit of it they're going to eat, but they can't, they can't eat all of it. So what they actually did is they, they would turn around and open up restaurants on the back of the temple. And they, in those restaurants, they would offer this food that had been given to the god, and they would offer it now in various forms that, that you, could, you could eat. So you could come and eat in one of those restaurants, and you'd be getting some of this meat that had actually been offered to the idol. Were you supposed to get a special blessing if you ate there? Probably. Probably, I assume. And Paul says, but now let's think about this for a moment. We know for a fact that these idols have no real existence. There is only one God. We all know who the real God is. So finally, Paul says, and I'm, I'm jumping way over to chapter 9, where he takes a little bit of a detour, but an important one. And through chapter 10, all the way down to um, verse 23. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23. And this is still in 1 Corinthians 10. This, yeah, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 23. So we're putting together three chapters. 1 Corinthians 8, 1 Corinthians 10, and our chapter we're studying today is Romans 14. Okay? I'm reading now 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23. We are all, uh, I'm sorry, we are allowed to do anything, so they say. That is, that is true, but not everything is good. We are allowed to do anything but not everything is helpful. None of you should be looking out for your own interests. Remember our discussion earlier about selfishness. Mm -hmm. None of you should be looking out for your own interests, but for the interests of others. Okay, now he's, he's, he's coming to his, to his punchline. You are free to eat anything sold in the meat market without asking any questions because of your conscience. He's not talking about questions because of cholesterol or something else like that. He's talking about ceremonial restrictions because of your conscience. You're, you are allowed to eat anything without asking any questions because of your conscience. For as the scripture says, the earth and everything in it belong to the Lord. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you decide to go, eat what is set before you without asking any questions because of your conscience. Once again, once again notice it's your conscience here. But if someone tells you this food was offered to idols, then do not eat that food for the sake of the one who told you and for conscience sake. That is not your own conscience, but for the other person's conscience. Whoa! You mean I, my liberty should be restricted by someone else's scruples? Well, isn't there a co collision of strength and faith or weakness of faith here? Because the person the person who doesn't want you to eat that meat is weak in faith. Okay. The one that, that says, I don't care because it doesn't do anything for you anyway, good or bad, they're strong in faith. So the person in strong in faith sounds like he's yielding to the weak one. Mm -hmm. This sounds like situation ethics. Oh dear. <laughs> oh dear. I mean, kind of a living sacrifice. I went, to, I went through something similar. When I started going to church at Campus Hill, I used to wear rings mm. on, in all my fingers. I, because as soon as I was turned 18, because I wasn't uh, allowed to, I put 
holes in my ears because it didn't make sense to me. Because that makes no sense whatsoever. God was not going to be angry with me because I wear rings on my fingers. As soon as I walked there, a gentleman on uh, hell, hell kept telling me, Yoli, take those off. You know, he kept, he, he didn't know me, but he befriended me. And he, it really bothered him because he believed that that would impede my salvation in some way. Mm -hmm. And after a while, I took him off, not because I believed, but because hell believed. Mm -hmm. And he wanted me something good for me. Mm -hmm. So I took him off. Every time I saw her, his wife was still alive, and she would laugh. She said, oh, my God, you know, ignore him. But I didn't. I took it all off because it bothered him so much. Mm -hmm. Well, there's an example. How about Ezekiel 16, what, what God says he did to Israel. He says, and uh, I decked you with ornaments, put bracelets on your arms, and chain on your mm -hmm. neck, and a ring in your nose, and earrings in your ears, and beautiful crown on your head. <laughs> so it's situation ethics, yeah. of course. Well, what we find out here, we don't have time to go through all the details, but Daniel ate, refused to eat the king's food, which had been offered to idols, because he thought by refusing to eat that food, he was rejecting the king's idols. Paul says in his day, no, if we eat the food, we're rejecting the idols because we're saying they don't account to anything, they don't have any effect on the food whatsoever. So by eating the food, we're rejecting the idols. Well, Paul goes on, but, um, well then, someone asks, why should my freedom to act be limited by another person's conscience? If I thank God for my food, why should anything, anyone criticize me about food for which I give thanks? Well, whatever you do, and now comes verses we quote quite often, well, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all for God's glory. Live in such a way as to cause no trouble either to Jews or Gentiles or to the church of God. Just do as I do, I try to please everyone in all that I do, not thinking of my own good, but of the good of all, so that they may, might be saved. And then he, he summarizes, imitate me just as I imitate Christ. Isn't, isn't that what Peter was doing? He was eating with the Gentiles and feeling good about it. And then when the brethren came along, he was going to eat with them. Mm -hmm. but, he was taken down for that. I mean, it was harmonized the two. Okay, well, the situation, that's a very good point. What's the difference? Here we're talking about someone who's a new believer who says, well, I'm not so sure about that food. You know, it was offered to idols. I'm not sure if we really should be eating it. And to help the new believer, you might say, okay, I won't eat it. But if the, if the person who's complaining just came from church headquarters and he's been in the church longer than you have you might say you know brother you ought to be mature enough to know that those idols don't affect this food in any way and that's what Paul is saying now we have to ask questions here there's a couple more things we need to talk about first of all what about that agreement they had back in Acts 15 which says the Holy Spirit and we have agreed not to eat food offered to idols. And Paul was there. Well, it's like, it sounds to me like a, it's just a rule to keep your neighbor Jew from gagging when you're there <laughs> eating. I mean, that's, that's all it's for. Yeah. And so, um, that's a good start. <laughs> well, it, you know, the, the Jew doesn't want to eat that stuff because he's weak, weak in faith, or else he probably doesn't like it, one or the other, because he's. You no, know, he's, he's grown up that way, and so and he's not going to change that. And quick. initially, he was told not to eat it. Yeah, so. right. But, so. a, but about those points, I'd just like to make one point about the Ten Commandments, mm -hmm. is that just because the Ten Commandments are not listed there, are mentioned there, does not exclude them or make them non-existent now, because certainly that freedom does not allow us to kill anyone or worship mm -hmm. other gods or or break any one of the Ten Commandments. What if, what if those commandments weren't written down? Would you want to kill somebody or steal from them? No. Okay. Well, the but some people might. Well, you know, Ken, we're talking about food offered to idols. Mm -hmm. And we've got that analyzed. What would that be today? Okay, well, uh, let's talk about that. That's a really important point. We come to the end of chapter 14, now back in Romans, where Paul sort of summarizes. And he's been talking about this same thing, food offered to idols and 
you know, judging another, other people within the church because of what they're doing. I don't like the, the, the length of your skirt. I don't like what the, the jewelry you're wearing. I don't like this. I don't like that. Judging you because you're not as good a Christian as I am because I, you do something which I don't think is right, da, da, da. All that kind of stuff he's talking about. And he ends up by saying in Romans 14, 23, but if they have doubts about what they eat, God condemns them when they eat it because their action is not based on faith and anything that is not based on faith is sin. Is that, is that saying that if we think something's wrong, mm -hmm. even though it might not be wrong, for us it, it is, is wrong. wrong and it would be sin if we did it. That's right. You're violating your con conscience by doing something that you think is wrong. And it's our conscience that is the communicator with God. So when we violate our conscience, we're plugging up the line of communication to God? Maybe, but I, I wouldn't put it that way. I would say our conscience is, a, is, is, the, is the, the, the wind indicator in our brain. It's, it's not that God is condemning us for what we do. It's, it's our own minds that are, are being broken down when we do something we think is wrong. So when we do something that's wrong, we are um, injuring our minds. Mm -hmm. Right. When we do something we think is wrong. Yeah. When we do something that we think is wrong, we, were inju yeah. we are injuring our minds, our own minds. But well. you know, this goes the other way too. If a person is, believes, if he knows this, that, you know, if I'm breaking my, my conscience, you know, I shouldn't be doing it. Well, but you know that the other person, it doesn't break his conscience doing it. You shouldn't condemn the person either. So, because you need to... You shouldn't tell him, hey, your conscience should tell you this is wrong. Yeah, you shouldn't you know? say, oh, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. Kind of like when you live in the dorm. When the well, we might be able to <laughs> tell them something, but maybe don't condemn them. Yeah. We, we can uh, kind of, iron sharpens iron a little bit. We can learn and teach and but both the, both sides, but don't condemn them. Well, maybe we're the wrong one. Well, that's well, what then, I'm saying. Yeah, then know. maybe we that's need to I'm learn. Saying. Iron sharpens iron. But maybe don't say, you know, you're going to hell. Uh, you're you're going to die. Maybe that might be too the hard. Story maybe is not it's over. true, but... The story is not over yet. Interestingly enough, uh, when after Paul had finished writing Romans and Galatians over the winter of A.D. 57-58, he decided he was going to get to Jerusalem in time for Passover. He had all, made all arrangements to board a boat, and he was going to get, get there very quickly. Just as he's about to get on that boat, we, Ellen White tells us, he discovered that already on the boat were people who were so much of hating Paul that they had already signed a pact together they were going to kill him when he got on the boat. So he couldn't take that shortcut. He had to back off, not go by boat. He started walking around the 600 miles all the way around to Ephesus again or somewhere over there uh, in the spring to, 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 get his way, to find his way back. So he says, no, I, I'm not going to make it by Passover. Maybe I can make it by Pentecost, which is in June. Well, we know that what happened. Finally, he got to Jerusalem quite a bit late. And he took with him a large group of people because they were carrying the offering which he'd collected from the cities of, uh, of Greece and Macedonia, a huge offering because problem, there were problems back in Judea. They were carrying this huge offering and they presented it down there um, in Jerusalem and the brethren said, wow, you know, these Gentiles have really gone overboard. I mean, they've really gone out of the way for us. That's amazing. But then they turned to Paul and they said, Paul, we think you should do this very conservative thing. We want you to take this vow. We want you to shave your head. We want you to go in the temple and go with this. And Paul went through that whole ceremony. And as you know, on the last day of this in the temple, carrying out this very conservative, very unchristian, in, in a sense, ceremony, he was arrested. And we know the rest of the story. Was that ceremony to cleanse him from being with the Gentiles? Or what was Probably. that ceremony? That was, that, their idea was he, they wanted him to prove that he was still a Pharisee. That's really what they wanted him to do. 
Ellen White has these words to say about that, very interesting words. Many of the Jews who had accepted the gospel still cherished a regard of the ceremonial law and were only too willing to make unwise concessions, hoping thus to gain the confidence of their countrymen, to remove their prejudice and to win them to faith in Christ as the world's dreamer. These are believers. Paul realized that so long as many of the leading members of the church in Jerusalem, the leading members of the church in Jerusalem, should continue to cherish prejudice against him, they would work constantly to counteract his influence. He felt that if by any reasonable concession he could win them to the truth, he would remove a great obstacle to the success of the gospel in other places. But he was not authorized of God to concede as much as they asked. Acts the Apostles, 405, paragraph 1. Who was right? Paul was right, and the church leaders were wrong. Be How can that happen? Before we finish with Romans, I have a question regarding the 13th chapter. Hmm? Uh, we, mentioned, we talk about Jesus not addressing the slave issue. If there are, there are more slaves today hmm. than there ever was, there's more slavery. If Jesus was here today, would he say to, and most of the slavery today involves little children hmm. being sex slaves, would Jesus tell those children, uh, slave, obey your masters? Or should we I, do yeah. something to stop that? Think things are quite different today because the kind of slavery you're talking about is, ne is not authorized by any government. It's, it's done under the table, hidden and so forth like this. So I think that's a different, completely different issue. I think Jesus would try to expose that in every way he possibly could. And once it's exposed, it, it's done because the laws are already against it. You know, people, oh, you're running out of time. Yeah, we're running out of time, but uh, we'd like you to, to, to make note of one thing. You may find our, our discussions interesting, um, and I hope that you've, they've been provocative, something for you to think about, to look at these verses. If you have a chance, go to our website at theox.org. That's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, where you'll find handouts study guides, and also teacher's guides for every book of the Bible, including ones like Romans. And you'll find out that, unfortunately, when try to answering a lot of the questions are raised by the book of Romans, the handout gets pretty long. But there you'll find a whole section that's basis for much of what we have talked about today. Hope you'll find it there, read it, and enjoy it. Thank you for being with us.